Hi, my name is Kurt Lloyd and I've been working for NASA here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida as a software developer for 26 years now. I grew up in central Illinois around a lot of cornfields and I got my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at the Missouri University of Science and Technology which is formerly called the University of Missouri at Rolla which is what it was called when I was there. I wish I could be there with you at the RSS conference or even streaming this talk live so that I could do a live Q&A session at the end. But I'm not available the week of the RSS conference, so I'm recording this video instead. I hope you enjoy it. I don't know if you realize it or not, but NASA is right now developing the technologies and the capabilities needed to send humans to Mars. We want to put humans on Mars in the 2030s. We're developing a deep space capable spacecraft called Orion, the Orion Space Capsule. And we're simultaneously developing a deep space capable rocket called the Space Launch System, or SLS. The SLS rocket is going to be the most powerful launch vehicle that we've ever flown. And it's going to take a powerful rocket like that to send large habitats, laboratories, vehicles, and equipment all the way to Mars. We've been sending unmanned probes and unmanned rovers to Mars for quite a while now, and we've learned a lot from those unmanned science missions. But we can learn so much more by sending humans and performing detailed hands-on exploration and even colonization of another planetary body. We do have some experience with human deep space exploration, though. Not me personally, but NASA, I mean. Back in the 60s, we sent astronauts to the moon, but those were very short missions. Apollo surface exploration time was only two hours on the first, uh, the first mission, and it was only 22 hours on the very last mission. Those were very quick in and out missions, but boy did, Na did NASA learn a lot from those missions. We can't do quick in and out missions like that on Mars, though because the journey from the Earth to the Moon was only three days, but the trip from Earth to Mars is actually six to eight months. And we're not gonna send, spend six months flying there and another six months flying back home to only spend a few hours or a few days exploring the surface of the planet. That's just ridiculous. So we're gonna be in it for the long haul. Astronauts will likely live on the surface of Mars for many, many months, probably over a year, actually. But there's a huge economics problem with a human mission to Mars. Every single kilogram that we have to launch from the surface of Earth to the surface of Mars is extremely costly. But what if we could make water on Mars? What if we could make oxygen on Mars? Each kilogram of a precious resource like that that we can actually make or generate on the surface of Mars is a kilogram that we won't have to ship all the way there from the surface of the Earth. We never worried about this sort of thing during a moon exploration mission because we just started that mission with everything that we needed for the entire trip. But it's just economically not, practically, pra not practical to do that for a long-term human exploration mission to Mars. The idea of living off the land while exploring space is called in situ resource utilization, or ISRU. In situ is Latin for on site, so it's on site resource utilization, or using the resources that you find on site. You might be wondering what kind of resources are out there that we can actually use. Well, one of the most precious resources, at least for us humans, is water. And you might be surprised to learn that water in frozen form can be found on the moon and on Mars and in comets and in some asteroids too. Not only is water precious, but if we break down the water into its elemental components, we get oxygen and hydrogen, which coincidentally can be used to fuel our rockets. I work in a te technology development lab here at the Kennedy Space Center that we affectionately call SwampWorks. SwampWorks is researching and developing ISRU technologies that could be used in future NASA manned deep space exploration missions. I'm standing inside the NASA SwampWorks lab right now 
and I'm going to give you a quick tour of a few of these ISRU technologies that we're developing here. Now right now I'm in what we call our innovation space. It's basically our conference room but it's designed to allow for creative thinking and innovation. We have a large TV wall on the far side of the room and we have lots and lots of whiteboards all around this room. Even some of the tables are whiteboards. And even the surfaces of the walls are actually whiteboard material. So it's really good for um, communication and innovation when uh, you've got a lot of people in the room and you're trying to communicate. Now, we're right now adding command workstations up here in our innovation area that we will eventually, once they're set up and working, we'll eventually be able to use these workstations to monitor and control several of our SwampWorks projects from up here in our innovation space. Now, this is a high-level mezzanine view of our SwampWorks lab. As you can see, it's a nice big space to work in and to be innovative. Now, let's go downstairs and let's look at some of the projects close up. So, before you can use the resources that are found on site, you, actu you actually find the resources. You may be aware of NASA's Curiosity rover that's currently exploring the surface of Mars right now. It's a wonderful, very wonderfully engineered robot. It's a complete engineering marvel, actually, and I definitely do not want to minimize its capabilities or its benefits. But one of its limitations is that it goes exactly where humans on Earth tell it to go. Its driving route and its rock studies are very carefully planned out by a team on the ground and then instructions are transmitted to the rover. This scenario works fine as long as your search area is the small corridor that your rover is covering in its driving path. But what if you needed to cover a large area looking for a precious resource? Could you actually do that with a single rover? Probably, but it would not be terribly efficient. It's time to think outside the box and be a little creative. So, meet the Swarmies. These little guys are not exactly qualified to go to Mars right now. They're actually made from common store-bought hobby robot parts. What they are is an Earth-based research platform that we're using to verify that a swarm of small robots can search a large, unmapped area and find resources and bring those resources back to a central location, like a lander, for example. The software on board these swarmies is actually inspired by ants. It turns out that desert seed harvester ants behave in a way that can be reduced to just a handful of pretty simple probabilistic equations. And once we programmed these simple equations into these swarmies, they behaved essentially like the seed harvester ants did in the wild. And these robots were able, were able to find and collect resources with roughly the same efficiency as those ants did in the wild. There are a couple really cool benefits here. One is that it does not take a super powerful onboard computer in order to execute these simple, uh, reduced, simplistic ant-like behaviors. And that's good because if we design a large swarm of rovers, we need each rover to be relatively inexpensive. Another cool benefit to this system is that because we made these robots communicate indirectly with each other by using a digital pheromone trail rather than directly talking to each other, that means that this system is able to be scaled up to hundreds or even thousands of robots and it will still work. I could probably talk for an hour about these swarmies, but we need to move on. Most of our robotic surface exploration has been done with wheeled rovers, which is fine on relatively flat ground 
or even on gentle slopes, which is where curiosity is exploring right now. But is that really where the precious resources are going to be found? Maybe not. There are some craters and canyons on Mars that are deeper than our Grand Canyon here on Earth. And this type of terrain just isn't accessible by wheeled robots. So what do we do if the precious resource is down at the bottom of a very deep and very steep walled crater? Or what if the precious resource is inside a cave? It's time to think outside the box again and get creative. The solution that Swampworks came up with is to design a flying robot rather than a driving one. Meet the Asteroid and Lava Tube ISRU Prospector, or ALTIP. ALTIP is a pneumatically propelled flying robot. It uses compressed gas thrusters right here to fly around in environments that contain little or no atmosphere. It's sort of like a quadcopter or a drone, but it uses thrusters instead of propellers. This robot will be able to land on an asteroid, take a surface sample using a small micro drill that's mounted to the leg, and then it will be able to fly back to the mothership with the sample where it can be tested and analyzed. This robot can also be used to explore and take samples inside lava tubes on the moon or on Mars. Now lava tubes are natural caverns or caves that are beneath the surface of a planet. And scientists believe that lava tubes are formed by volcanic processes. We don't yet know what precious resources might be found inside a lava tube on the moon or on Mars. There might be frozen water down there that never sees any sunlight. There might also be other really cool, useful mineral deposits down there. But these underground caves or caverns could collapse on top of anyone who tries to explore them. So exploring them and prospecting inside would be best accomplished with robots like Altip. Also, once your robot goes underground, it will be nearly impossible to maintain radio communications with it. So full autonomy is gonna be required for a mission like this. Once the prospectors do their thing and they tell us where the precious resources are located, the next step is going to be to collect that precious resource. The resource might be buried beneath the surface, or it might even be chemically bound to the soil. So we're going to need some mining equipment. Here on Earth, when we excavate or mine, we use very large, very heavy digging equipment. But heavy equipment is not going to be possible in space. So we've been researching ways to dig or excavate using very lightweight equipment. Meet the Regolith Advanced Surface Systems Operations Robot, otherwise known as Razor. Razor is designed to be a workhorse of regolith or dirt excavation, but it's also very simple and very lightweight. Razor is behind me inside our large regolith test bin. Now, regolith is a fancy scientific word for dirt on another planetary body. Razor is getting ready for a test, so you can't get a really good look at it right now. But I'm going to interleave some, vid some video footage that we took earlier so that you can see Razor in action. Now, in order to excavate regolith or, or moon dirt or Mars dirt, the two sets of spinning drums on the front and on the rear of the robot will spin. Then the arms are lowered down into the soil and small digging buckets or scoops that are mounted on the drums will scoop up the soil. The drums are actually hollow with baffles inside that will hold the excavated material. Razor actually drives forward while digging in order to dig a, a shallow but long trench. This is called slot trench excavation. Now once the drums are full, the arms are lifted back up and the robot then drives off with its load of material. When the robot reaches the processing plant back at the lander, it reverses the direction of the drum rotation in order to unload the soil. Then Razor goes back and digs 
in the same slot trench over and over again, each time digging down just a centimeter or two. Over time, Razor will dig down far enough to reach the precious water ice that's buried beneath the surface. While digging, the drums are rotating in opposite directions. That opposite rotation actually makes the horizontal digging forces cancel out. In other words, when this robot is digging, it can barely even feel it. While digging, it doesn't need to provide traction in the opposite direction like the heavy mining mach machines that we use here on Earth. Now, by testing this excavation design here in the lab and lifting up on the robot, we've proven that this robot can dig in very low gravity conditions. And that is going to be very useful on the moon or on Mars someday. I want to mention that this robot is small enough and light enough that it might be worth looking into sending a swarm of these ro digging robots to Mars. Several of these robots could keep a steady, uninterrupted stream of material flowing into a processing plant on Mars. Plus, if one robot breaks down, the others can continue to operate and the mission won't be lost. Now, I'll open up the door to our regolith test van and I will let you see the simulated lunar regolith that we're testing Razor inside of right now. It's actually crushed volcanic rock that we got from Black Point lava flow in Arizona. This finely crushed volcanic rock actually behaves a lot like lunar soil. You can see a slot trench there on the left where Razor has been excavating recently. And on the right, you can see sort of a hill where Razor has been dumping all the material that it's excavated. I could probably talk for an hour about several other cool ISRU projects that are being researched and developed here in Swampworks. Like 3D printing with on-site lunar or Martian soil to build hard, radiation-proof structures around our soft, inflatable habitat modules. Or like creating hard tiles out of on-site lunar or Martian soil and then using those tiles to build roads or to build spacecraft landing strips or like the electrostatic dust shield technologies that can keep this fine dust off of our robots and off of our optical systems. But I'm out of time. I just want to let the audience know that planetary exploration using a swarm of robots is a relatively new idea here at NASA. But the concept of using multiple small robots instead of a single large robot to perform a task appears to be gaining some traction in this community. It's pretty cool to consider that software that student teams are designing and creating might someday end up operating on Mars and helping us find and gather resources that will keep the astronauts alive during their long-term surface exploration missions. So continue to be creative and continue to think outside the box with all your solutions to your problems because that's often the only way the really hard problems can be solved. So thank you for your interest and enjoy the rest of the RSS conference.